All right, welcome back to the Cornfield Customs Channel, and this week I am back on the Hanchard Special uh, Bonneville 2829 Model A Roadster. So I kind of want to show you guys what I've been working on since the last episode. So some of the stuff that I've been working on that I haven't uh, taken videos of just because I kind of got in a hurry and got lazy with filming. Um, so I went ahead and I welded up our front cross member on this top seam because the pieces I showed in the last one, the little angled um, machined parts for the radiator mount, I got those tacked in and I knew I wouldn't be able to come back in and weld that seam up once these were in place. So I went ahead and welded that seam then got our angled mounts uh, tacked in place. So the radiator is kind of mocked up. I just used bolts now while I wait on the studs and springs to come in. And then I also came in and these are the half inch steel plates that I mentioned I was going to cut flush. Let me take one of them off. So I went in and I cut uh, a notch in every space you see one of these plates and it's the width of the five by six so it's six inches wide half inch deep and flush mounted that in the top of our frame here that way the aluminum floor can go on and then the body and the roll cage will sandwich the floor to the frame so um, yeah, these are the half inch steel plates that I machined, drilled and tapped. And like I said, they're notched down into the frame, flush across the top. And I went ahead and welded up the top seam and dressed those all the way around. And then I have our landing plates that are bolted on top for now, where the roll cage structure will come down and land on our mount plates. So got all of those in and the rear end is hung. Um, it's on just some risers for now. I've uh, got the rear cross member in, and I just use these pieces of one by one that are 11 inches apart. Uh, the holes on the one by one are 11 inches apart to mock up for our coilovers that will be here this week. Lower coilover mount is tacked to the rear end, so both sides. Um, so not a ton of progress, but still a little bit that I'm happy about. So with all of that stuff done, um, we can go and continue working on the front suspension stuff with the kingpin bushings. Um, talking about the front end, I did get the front spring hung, um, shackles. I like to use the oilite style bushings instead of the plastic ones that come with the shackle kit. So this is all just kind of hung in place, being held up with this jack for now, mocking everything up. So I've got the wishbone and I tacked in our tie rod end pieces that make the wishbone adjustable. And there's the machined bung that I will get into how to make um, later on in this video. And that will go to our wishbone drop that comes off of the frame down. So I still have to make those. And yeah, everything else is kind of coming together slowly but surely and let's get back to actually working on the car. So I'm up here at the lathe machining some um, tie rod end tapered bungs um, for the Roadster. And the reason you have to do that is if you're not familiar with suspension stuff, um, tie rod ends have this taper here and these are early Ford tie rod ends. So it's a seven degree taper. So I have to machine that taper into the bung that will be welded to our wishbone drops and anywhere that uh, I'm going to use a tie rod end as a connection point. So you can't just use straight tube and hope that it doesn't wiggle around in there. You have to come in and machine that proper taper for your tie rod end into the part. So what I've done is this one's already done so I could kind of show you that it does slip together and it fits in there real nice. Um, so I have the other three 
One is already chucked up in the lathe, and then these are just pieces of one inch OD DOM quarter wall tube. Uh, I've cut to length, and I've just faced off both sides so it's nice and clean. And I've got our seven degree taper set up in the lathe itself, and we will go ahead and put the lathe in back gear, and we will machine that taper in using the reamer, and the lathe slowed way down. So to test to see if I've got it reamed deep enough, usually what I do is I'll take our tie rod end here and I will just test fit it until it comes up deep enough to where it touches the rubber. So there you can see we still have about a quarter, maybe, maybe a heavy quarter um, that I still need to ream out just to get that to seat in there where I want it. So we'll come back in and we'll continue the reaming process until I get the tie rod in to fit the depth on the bung that I would like. All right, they're just making contact with the rubber seal or the rubber boot on our tie rod end. So I will declare this one good enough and we will continue to do our other two bushings here with the taper and then I can get back to working on the car itself. With putting the front end back together, I'm about ready to hang the spindles. Um, but before I do that, I need to replace the kingpins and the kingpin bushings. So I've got one of our spindles clamped up here in the vise, and I'm going to knock the old kingpin bushings out. And I use some tools that I've made in the past to help drive those out. So we'll knock the top one out first. Then I'll turn the spindle around and we'll knock the other one out. All right, so the process for putting the kingpin bushings back in is essentially the same. We're gonna drive in our new kingpin bushings and I'm going to use a different tool than we use to extract it. And I'll show you those two tools and you can make one at home if you have access to a lathe. So the tool to extract the kingpin, it's got a little notch on it there and it sits inside and then this is slightly undercut from the outer diameter of the kingpin bushing so we can knock that through the spindle. So the one to install it that I made slides inside to support the inside of the kingpin bushing and then is flush on the outside so I can drive it in. So with doing this, there's a hole and that hole is for our grease fitting. So we're gonna line that up and get it started. I'm gonna take just a little bit of grease or a little bit of oil here and lubricate that. And then we'll take our install tool, make sure that our hole is lined up pretty close. With uh, the first bushing installed there, I'm gonna flip it over and we will install the next bushing. Again, I'm gonna line up our hole here to where the grease fitting goes. A little bit of oil. With both bushings installed, now I have to ream it out to the proper diameter. 
So we take our kingpin, it doesn't fit in the hole because the bushing is slightly undersized, so it can be reamed out for proper alignment. So this is a piloted kingpin reamer. Um, it's adjustable, so I've dialed it in and got it the right diameter for our kingpin. I don't remember what that is off the top of my head, but um, I've sized it to an early Ford kingpin years ago and just set it and forget it. So it's piloted, so we slide this through and then there's a conical pilot that goes in the bottom to help line everything up. And we just use a tap handle and I'm just gonna hold the pilot in the bottom And I'm not really pushing down, I'm just letting the tool do the work and get started. And just nice and slow, ream that bushing out. And when we get to the bottom, I'm just gonna use my pointer finger to push up as I continue to rotate the reamer. Everything looks good there. So then we'll flip it over and we'll repeat the process still using our pilot. All right, so I've got the king pin and I'm just gonna make sure it slides in there. Nice and snug as it should be. So from there, I'm gonna take it back loose. I'm gonna turn it around because we have to clean out where the grease fittings go. So I've got a quarter 28 fine thread tap. And everything should line right up because we made sure to line our hole up but they just make sure that the hole is all the way cleaned out to get the grease to the kingpin. And we'll do the other one. All right, and from here, I like to run the kingpin reamer back in again, just to make sure there's not a burr from where we ran the tap back through for our grease fittings. Then from there, I'll just take a little bit of brake cleaner and we'll blow out the threads and our kingpin. And I'll put a little oil on our kingpin and we'll just test fit it again. And it slides right in just like it should. So now we have one more to do and then we'll be ready to install the spindles on the axle. All right, so now that our kingpin bushings are done, I'm going to assemble the kingpin and this little metal cap goes on the top with uh, the recess side facing up in this position. That way when we put our felt on, we can slide that up and it sits in that recess and that helps hold any grease and oil and stuff in there and helps keep dirt and stuff out. So then we can grab our spindle And I'm just gonna loosely put that there for a second while I grab the thrust bearing and some shims. So I'm gonna spin this out of the way. And next up, our thrust bearing goes under here and we've got some shim stock, which I may need to see if I've got more shims, just in case there's uh, any discrepancy between the axle and the spindle. So, I only had two shims left uh, from doing the other side. And you can see there's a little bit of play there. So when I put it together for the final time, 
I have to order some more shims. That way I can shim that out properly. And I'm going to rotate this until our lock notch uh, down in the, our lock hole is lined up. And you have to make sure that that is lined up because our kingpin lock here has a little notch that goes inside of that. So I'm gonna get that lined up and kind of pushed in place. And here our felt is kind of holding that up. So I'm gonna get a hammer and just kind of tap down on it while I push the lock into place. All right, so you can see that our lock is there. I don't have it pulled in all the way because I'm still gonna have to take all this stuff back apart. So I don't wanna get too carried away and get everything tightened up to where I'm gonna have to draw it back out. So even here, you can see our nut is just finger tight for now. And same thing like on all our shackles. I don't wanna get into the nylon and the nylocks because then I'll technically have to replace those again. So everything's just going together finger tight for now. And so now we have both spindles on. So I've got this side steering arm just kind of loosely put in place. Uh, I have to order new bolts. I'm gonna use socket cap screws, uh, socket cap bolts instead. That way the socket cap will go next to this lip that was for locating the backing plate originally. So the hex style bolts, they get hung up on that corner. So I'm just gonna order some socket caps to replace those and then I can tighten up our steering arms. I still have to put the steering arm on what would be the driver's side. So. Next up on this, I have to design our wishbone drops that I mentioned earlier in this video. So I have to get those designed and cut on the CNC plasma, get everything cleaned up, bent in the press brake and ready to go on. I've got some steering parts made up. I got the hubs put on, new bearings. Uh, the wheels just set in place now, that way I can get a better visual on it. Went ahead and made the wishbone drops and got the coilovers mounted, working on the pan hard bar for the back and the mounts for it, as well as I got some of the pieces cut for the rear wishbones that I still need to put on, but I have to notch one of my, uh, my risers here on the table. That way I've got room for them to come through to mount to the rear end. And as you can see, I've been working on part of the roll cage structure. So that's what I'm gonna get into a little bit today. Um, the main, horizontal hoop. Uh, I started with uh, getting all my base measurements and then I used the roll bender to roll bend the sweeping curve and then I bent the main 90s there at the back and bent up the cowl hoop and the rest have just been straight and notched. So from here moving forward I'm going to start showing you guys uh, cutting and notching and fitting up the diagonals. So I've got one diagonal in place that you can see here on the front section of what would be the driver's side. So I still have to do both pieces on the passenger side, this rear diagonal, and then I'll have either a diagonal or an X at the back. And I do have a tube that drops down from our cow bar and runs back to help build what will be our driver compartment. So that's kind of next on my uh, list of things to do is to keep cutting and notching some tube. So I'll show you how I do that. Um, we're just gonna use the bandsaw to cut our tubes to length, and then we'll use our Bailey TN250 tube notcher to notch all our ends, get everything deburred, and fit into the chassis. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm here at the main work table and this is the Bailey TN250 tube notcher. So I've still got the angle set up from when we did the driver's side front diagonal and here's our second tube for that. So I'm just gonna slide that here into the notcher and slide our hole saw forward. And we need about a quarter inch inside of the hole saw to start the notch. So I'm not pulling any measurements yet. I know what this tube length is, which is 26 and a quarter. So I'm just gonna notch the end of the tube and then I'll lay out our overall length for the other notch and uh, we'll get this notch to fit. But we're gonna clamp down this tri bar handle here at the top and then we will use our angle drill here and we'll just drill through with the hole saw notching the tube.
Now let's see if the tube actually fits in the car. And everything fits pretty good. So I don't take my tubes completely into the corner, splitting both top and bottom or uh, vertical tube and horizontal tube. Uh, technically it is a stronger union to do it that way and makes the cage stronger. But what you have to take into consideration with that is what kind of force is it gonna take for this to fail being slightly below or above the weld seam here, not completely into the corner and the ease of putting things together. So if I did this to where it was notched, splitting the horizontal and the vertical tube here, kind of like that, I would have to build it to be this piece, this piece, then this angled piece, and I would have to build it as I worked my way backwards because if it was so tight, you wouldn't be able to put this tube into place. So I try to split it to be about 3 8 of an inch of a gap at the bottom here where it meets the landing plate and up into the corner because it's easier to fit, it's easier to weld, and it's plenty strong for the application. You know, to shear that off and to cause an issue, it would be such an immense load or force that it would probably kill you anyway. Um, and if you look at a lot of the diagrams on uh, race car certification charts or uh, examples of roll cages, the tubes do not always meet in the very center of the triangle. Um, so take that into consideration that there's a difference between engineering and practical application and use in the real world. So I'm gonna continue notching tubes. I'm gonna get this one kind of spaced up and tacked in place. And I think before I do these other diagonals here, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna notch the tube I have bent from the cowl back to start building our cockpit. So that's what I'm gonna keep doing is notching tubes. So before I get back to notching tubes, I wanted to talk again just briefly about with the tubes not meeting up directly into the corners. So what I did is I just pulled down my 2023 SCTA rule book and it has a diagram for uh, an example of a road store or a glass uh, bodied vehicle, which this is. It's a 2829 fiberglass Model A body. And if you look at the picture, the tubes don't land in the corners of the diagonal on this drawing. So it's always a good idea if you're ever in any kind of question of is this safe, is this legal for my class or with the sanctioning body, always consult back to your rule book and if it's not clear enough for you, reach out to an inspector for that sanctioning body and just have them clarify if it's acceptable or not. So now that, uh, now that I've kind of shown you that it's in the rule book and I'm meeting it as drawn, I'm gonna get back to notching tubing. With our tube notched, we can uh, kind of put it in a place. Got a reference mark there. And I'm just gonna use this little uh, clamp here to hold it up to the level. And it fits pretty good. Um, overall, really happy with it. Make sure this is lined up. I'll have to get a square in here and make sure that uh, I square the tube up. But the center tube here will uh, start to define the driver compartment all on its own. It's gonna be a separate, like a separate compartment that'll have its own aluminum walls here to keep the driver completely confined. And then over here, I can put all our fire suppression and anything else we need that's a non-combustible. But I'm gonna have a 
Completely separate, aluminum skinned driver compartment to keep the driver safe. So let me get some uh, magnets and squares and we'll get this squared up and tacked in place. So before I tacked the front of the tube here, um, I came into the back and I had our reference mark of where I wanted the center of the rear tube to be. But since our outer tubes are kind of curved and the cow bar is narrower than the back, it's tough to get a measurement to make sure that everything is square. So what I did, and I just wanted to show you a good way to measure, um, I dropped a plumb bob off the front on the inside of the cockpit tube and the back. And then I came down here to our center line that runs from the front of the table to the back that I've been using to square everything off of um, since the beginning of building this chassis. And then I measure from our plumb bob to the center line and our plumb bob to the center line. And that will ensure that this tube ends up square to the center line of our chassis. Um, and to me, that's pretty critical just so everything remains nice and square and I have a good solid line that I can pull measurements from in the future. So just wanted to give you that little bit tip of using plumb bobs and string lines and why it's so important and it helps you ensure that you get to keep everything nice and square. All right, so I'm curious about how the helmet cage is gonna look and get our front angled bar for the actual roll cage itself going together. Um, so I'm just gonna bend up a tube to, hopefully it'll work, but if nothing else, it'll at least simulate, uh, simulate those bars. That way I can get a visual and start pulling some measurements. So sometimes that's needed uh, just to do a tube that's just there as a reference point. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So what I did is I just pulled some initial measurements and this will be our main upright that comes up over the back of your head and forward, uh, again, to pull measurements and we'll hope it works. Um, so with just my initial measurements, I calculated the tube needing to be 30 and an eighth long, which is what we have here. So I'm gonna slide it into our Bailey tube bender and our bend should start at 11 and 7 eighths. So we will line up from the end of our tube to our zero point at 11 and 7 eighths. And we'll turn the machine on and we're gonna bend it to 90 degrees. Machine set at 90. And we'll let it go around uh, until it kicks off at 90 degrees. Our spring back's already calculated. So I'm gonna just notch the bottom of this tube. That way I can clamp it or magnet or tack it to our uh, the rest of our cage work there to give us our reference point to shoot for. So let me get it notched and we'll go ahead and get it on the chassis. So I need to measure where our upright's gonna go and we're gonna start with a center line from our cockpit tube over to the center line of our upright tube because that's roughly where our back is going to be centered. So we're at 22 inches. So if we come in to 11, that gives us our center line of our cockpit. And I want our tubes six inches on center. So I'm just gonna come over three inches on each side of that center line. And that gives us the approximate location of our uprights. So let me grab that upright tube and I'll use some magnets to position our outer one and uh, check and see how things are gonna look visually and I can start to measure for our front tube of the roll cage. And essentially that's what our main cage tube will look like and we'll just trim this off later as need be. 
Um, we just have to make sure our helmet fits in there and that the forward edge of our helmet is at least three inches behind the forward face of our down tube. 